Welcome to the Business Sense with Brad podcast. As usual, I'm sponsoring myself. I have opened my own management consulting firm. If you are a small business or nonprofit in East Tennessee or beyond, I offer both in-person and virtual consults. Check out businesssensejc.com. That's businesssensejc.com to contact me. Today's guest is Adam O'Neill, who owns Adam O'Neill and Associates located in Fairfax, Virginia. He is a psychiatric physician assistant and is author of The Mind After Eden, Psychiatry in a Post-Fall World. You can find out more about him at aoavirginia.com. Well, cool. Well, I guess as we get started, just tell us like uh, about your background, uh, Adam, and just kind of let us know kind of like how'd you get to where you're at? Yeah, it's a good question. And I often, you know, uh, I, I wonder how I often would tell it um, because I didn't know that I would be sitting where I am today years and years ago. Um, I, I think if I have to put a header on it, it would be kind of the search for something more. Um, I started my uh, educational career at Western Michigan University, which is a, a predominantly behavioral uh, psychology school. And, you know, you think operant classical conditioning, Pavlov and and uh, Skinner and his rats and cages, which is a fascinating field. But um, I really was looking at, you know, I wanted to understand humans and thinking there's got to be something more than just pure behavior. So that led me uh, to pursue more, uh, I'd say, like the scientific theory of the mind and uh, training in neuroscience uh, and psychology, which that happened at Wheaton College in Chicago, uh, which is a great time there and learned a lot. And um, started the integration between what it means to be human and affirming that we have both this you know physical body and an immaterial soul which is sort of the worldview i i work under but i would say it wasn't until in my graduate work in in studying medicine and i uh moved to philadelphia went to thomas jefferson university to get my master's and uh learn how to practice as a physician assistant that i started to really apply those concepts of you know, this integration model uh, to to actual people in the clinic. And so uh, since then, I have uh, moved, uh, taken those theories that I learned and moved down to the Northern Virginia, D.C. area where I opened uh, a private uh, psychiatry practice. So I uh, currently work uh, for myself and uh, it's it's been great, but continue to explore uh, the you know concepts of philosophy, psychology, uh, hard sciences, um, that I love. And I, I often tell my patients that it's it's really, really great to be able to have both uh, philosophy books, my medical reference books, and even for me working from a Christian context to have my Bible on my desk. So it's been great. Uh, that's kind of how I got to where I am today. Well, yeah. And I think just from the beginning of uh, ph- philosophy, even if we just go back, you know, even the 500 BC or whatever, pretty much the mind, uh, soul dichotomy or the physical mind, body, soul. I mean, we really haven't I don't know if we've gotten much farther, like understanding it. Like, I mean, obviously yeah. we understand the brain more for sure, but like sure. the soul, how the soul interacts with the body or what exactly is. And even for someone that isn't spiritual, if you will, right? they right. cannot explain so much. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that, you know, they're wrong per se or whatever, but right. like understanding like how material body produces immaterial thought. And so I don't know how much further we've gotten on that aspect versus, um, of course, the brain science. And I, yeah, I would say it wasn't like you said, it was not long ago that, uh, you know, they they believed that the soul was housed in that small hollow organ in the brain, the pineal gland when they were, you know, and I've dissected brains and I've, I've looked at them and seen that that small space and thought, you know, yeah, that's kind of odd in this mass of dense tissue to have this little, you know, opening. And of course, that's, that's where they attributed the, the soul lived in that, that spot. So we really, as you're right, we have not made it very far uh, in our understanding. <laughs> Well, yeah. And so, uh, so you've written about AI before. Um, and so I guess if, without going to the article, what was the kind of the gist of that? I've read it obviously, but what's yeah. the gist of your AI? And I don't know if you've read, written more than one blog post on that. Um, could you just get the gist of that and where could people yeah. find that? It, it was a little bit of a response to, you know, the, the comments I was getting from my patients of like, Hey, are, are you worried about your job? And that's a, that's an interesting thing because I, you know, there are economists who've talked about the impact of, of AI on, on the world economy on, and, and then how that relates to individual jobs. And I, I really thought about that. It, I, as someone who tries to bridge the gap between the physical and the non-physical and, 
you know, and then and then myself exploring things like chat GPT and just typing things in at one time I had put in, you know, write a treatment plan for, a, you know, 50 year old patient with major depressive disorder and was very impressed with what it, it produced. And I'm like, OK, so here's something that's that is very interesting. And yet there's always at least there was something missing. So I, I, I tried to determine what, what was that things? What are those things that are missing? And that's how I I you know, ended up producing this article, which was basically arguing, and we can get into whatever elements of it that you'd like, but just that, you know, there's something about sentience, there's something about consciousness, and there's something about conscience that is uh, unique to the the human. And uh, really exploring that, you know, my field in psychiatry, particularly, we, we deal in those realms daily. Uh, the things that present to psychiatry offices are uh, wide ranging, and they extend far beyond, you know, depression, anxiety, although that is something that we we do. So that's sort of what spurred the article in some ways a defense of my defense of my job. All right. Where can they find that? Yeah. So that's going to be on my blog. You can go to my website, which is uh, www.aoavirginia.com slash blog. Awesome. And uh, I don't know how deep to get already um, because I, like this idea and again i think ai is i'm not sure if i like that term um cuz i don't know again we're getting philosophical what is intelligence you know right right um but from what i've seen a lot of especially if we're just talking about machine learning and uh what chat gpt's doing or whatever it's like you know it has a model it's built off of and then it adapts basically and then it tries to predict things is what i'm seeing um a lot of this is based off this idea of neural network can you explain what that kind of yeah. is, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, kind of to to frame it, you know, machine learning uh, being those, you know, the process through using algorithms and structures to train a model. Uh, it makes sense then that in training a model, think of that like the uh, uh, Skinner boxes I talked about with, with BF Skinner and, and the rats of like, okay, if we give rewards and punishments, we can, you know, train something uh, to do a task that we, you know, would prefer. Uh, and then neural networking sort of as a subset of machine learning saying, well, OK, maybe the best way then to achieve artificial intelligence. And I'm, I'm with you in terms of frustrations regarding that term. But in order to achieve that, perhaps we just mimic what we know of the brain. And um, we know I'll just preface this by saying we know very little of the brain. I mean, we've scratched the surface, really. So but but neural networking attempting to mimic how we think synapses work. So long ago uh you know it was it was thought actually not that long ago truthfully uh that synapses were almost individualized you know one of the first models that was produced was sort of the grandma cell or the or the jennifer aniston cell uh so it's like maybe you have a, a neuron that fires when you see your grandma or sees jennifer aniston that's how that registers you know for your brain but uh it was quickly discovered that that's that's not how our our brains are functioning instead Perhaps um, it's more about the firing pattern, you know, like zeros and ones and their combinations. But even that is not uh, sufficient and, and doesn't fully explain how we get from stimulus to the uh, concept we call the mind and, and it, uh, experience. So uh, but at its core, neural networking involving uh, certain nodes that would behave like uh, synapses in a chain. So you have your input nodes and uh, your somewhat intermediate or hidden nodes, and then at the end, uh, an output node. Um, and, and the hope is that, you know, with the information you're putting into the input nodes and however you've trained these intermediate or hidden nodes, that at the end, you would get to the output node that you were looking for. Um, so again, that's a very, uh, you know, I, the brain is much more complex than that, but I think that neural networking is attempting to approximate a little bit of what we know of the brain. Well, and what I can tell too, it's almost as if we break it down simply, it's like input, decision-making, output, feedback, tweak. Yeah. So it, from what I can tell, and I was looking at this a YouTube video, that's where I get all of my knowledge these yeah, days. Yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> but I, was, I wanted to see a visual of this. And basically they have a circle and then they have the pixels within the circle and they pull the pixel out, which is a square. Um, and then it goes through like the neurons or whatever. And um, it eventually gets through the decision-making phase and then it outputs based, and this is all based on probabilities. And then, so at the end of the day, it says, uh, this is a square when really it's a part of a circle. So it gets it wrong. And mm -hmm. then 
but it waits all of the things. It keeps waiting it as you go. It kicks it back, sends it back. And when it figures it out, you know, it's learning, but mm -hmm. it's all probability models. And I, I probably didn't explain that very well, but like, I think the feedback loop's important because it's like, <laughs> Here's the object or what what have you that we're trying to identify. It goes through this network eventually. It basically input, process, output. Mm -hmm. And then, but everything's broken down into zeros and ones and it's weighted. So, and then what I can see is, okay, we're really, we're getting into extremely reductionist yeah. way of seeing things, which goes right into that behavioral school. Am I, did, did anything I say make sense or do I have it all wrong? No, no, I, I, I agree. And that's what, what I, I grow frustrated with the, this concept of, you know, that the human brain is more of just working on probability or it's kind of like a, in some sense, yes, there's a go, no go for each neuron to fire. And that that's the, you know, the threshold at which we have to depolarize a neuron before it would fire. So yes, there is a sense of, of a, probability and, and reaching a certain point and then firing. But the brain is so much more complex than that. And, and um, there's even massive philosophical uh, implications to making decisions based on pure probability or pure, like, you know, I don't know how far deep you want to get to these types of things, but even looking at like a utilitarian approach to decision making. I mean, if you have AI utilizing pure probabilities to determine, you know, something, well, you have to program it using a, a framework and it, you know, it might not be what we call sort of morality. Maybe it's based on, you know, ut utilitarian model of bringing the most good to the most people or a hedonistic model of bringing the most pleasure to the most people. So, yeah, I think there's, uh, yeah, th there's something about the brain that it, it does work on these elements of, of uh, zeros and ones, but it's something more than that too, which is that's that odd, uncomfortable gap that I, I work in <laughs> and exist in. Right. And maybe connected to a soul or something. Um, yes. Well, yes. And what I find on the utilitarianism side, too, is it's essentially it's you're doing weighted, um, you know, if there's uh, I always love the old school Ford Pino case, you know, and it's like, you know, the the Fords get uh, rear ended and they explode if there's uh, too little gas in the tank. And so the the Ford decided from the greatest good for the greatest number is it best to recall this. Because Ford's technically not causing the crash as someone else is hitting, but a screw is penetrating the gas mm -hmm. tank and whatever. And then they basically looked at what do the court cases cost us. And the recall was like an 11 cent plastic cap, but people bring them in and they basically weighted all these things and made a very bad decision not to recall it based on the what a court case cost. Exactly. Like $200,000. But that so that's a bad example like if of using utilitarianism badly cuz their greatest good they defined it as the bottom line right, right um and also too we just don't know always know outcomes and we can't always put outcomes in zero one like you know like when you think war should we go into this country you can't just put zeros and ones like fatality is weighted this right um new okay. governments weighted that it doesn't life is too Again, it's like, what's the greatest good for the greatest number? We can't reduce that all to zeros and ones and probability. Am I wrong? Right. Or... right. No, I, I would say it's, it is a, we can certainly create a, a, a very scary dystopian world where, you know, every, you, every possible, you know, if, if all the data is known about you and about, you know, the way you might, you know, react to a certain situation and we can uh, apply that using, you know, quantum computing and determine, you know, come up with a score between negative one and one. And, you know, if you fall below a certain line, well, bye bye, you know, that that's a scary world to think about. Um, and, and certainly it, it uh, minimizes and, and it, it's a reductionist view of what it means to be human and that we are not a uh, sum total of our actions or, or, you know, the things that we can produce. Um, and so, you know, and that's an important concept too, even in psychology or philosophy, that even if you could say about the, the soul or about the human, if we could list out all the things that it was possible for us to do and add them together, it still does not, you know, make what it means to be human. And that's sort of the, you know, gestalt uh, psychology or philosophy of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So I even worry about that as it, it relates to AI of, are we just saying, well, here's what it means to be human. Let's list out. 10 things and, you know, or the 10 most popular, you know, common and, and important things. And then say, if we can get a computer to do that, it's, it's, it's us, it's, it's as good as us. And I'm, I, I think that will never happen personally. Yeah. And I, I know that like the, you know, AI, if you will, has passed the, what it means to be human test, but that's just a test. It's like, right, right. it's just not really anything the, other than like, oh yeah. Like, uh, are you breathing? Humans breathe. Right. Do humans right brood uh and right. get upset and you know so i don't know
Well, and I've I've often wondered what the you know Alan Turing's uh, idea was in the Turing test because clearly he was saying you know and for uh, you know if listeners don't know but he basically was that the, a major benchmark for artificial intelligence is can you convince a, another human that you are in fact not a, a machine and are human and and we they have uh, passed that you know we have gotten to that benchmark but I've often wondered you know what was that testing you know because large language models and things like Chat GPT are are very good. They're almost like um, mimics. You know, they can parrot things back to us or echo sort of what we say and sound a lot like us. But that's very different than than generative, like generating new uh, content. And just as a small example, I'm you know the I'm currently reading Dostoevsky's um, The Brothers Karamazov, and I, I mean that I I think it's argued it has been argued by much greater minds than mine that that could be the greatest novel ever written. And it's I've seen Chat GPT write a lot of things, but I don't know that anything like what what I'm reading in that book could ever come from something that is simply parroting other things that humans have said um, as well, one example. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's it's predicting like what you know, it's almost like a glorified, you know, you're typing a text message and it's trying to predict the word. Yeah. Uh, and, but it gets really good at that. And then like, can yeah. you predict this with a Southern accent? And then it <laughs> learns and it, it says it back or whatever. But at the end of the day, even if it's like, write me a poem that's, you know, uh, 2000 words and this phrasing about this, it's still using its training, trying to predict if the outcomes, there's enough outcomes that doesn't, that are wrong, it'll go feedback, which is the amazing part. It'll feedback and try to correct itself, but it's yeah. not, it's learning from a statistical point of view, but it's not really learning, but which I guess that gets into what does really learning is. Cause do we learn behaviorally, if you will, if that's even a word behavior, behaviorally, um, yeah. we, we do a lot of that, but that's not all we are again. So I, that gets exactly. interesting. Exactly. And why and, and we can even ask the question of, you know, why was why is Dostoevsky's work so, you know, amazing and beautiful? It's well, because he he feels. I mean, we talk about sentience, the ability to feel. Like he he's able to convey emotions because he himself feels. And and that's something that's unique to humans. So, you know, uh, and, and not only, you know, even if I want to look at a little bit of that, let's let's take it neurologically and say humans ha have do have mirror neurons which allow us to reflect and the emotions of someone else to both feel what they're feeling and then reflect it back. And we see that as young as birth, you know, these mirror neurons are, are there to echo between, you know, baby and mother and, and that relationship is that bonding is happening. But um, that, that even if I, I truly believe, even if we were to somehow discover how mirror neurons work and try to program it in, it is different than, than for it to spontaneously occur in the mind of a human. So Right. And th this ties into the semantics versus syntax. Could yeah. you go, uh, if you studied that at all, and I, I know yeah. that applies to computer programming, but other fields as well, philosophy too, obviously. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I, looking at uh, syntax, I mean, uh, like we, traditionally or in literature, you know, looking at syntax as the structure of how, how a sentence is built, you know, noun, verb, adjective, you know, punctuation, things like that versus semantics being the meaning behind a word. So you know, we often see that when you're on a, a server or a um, program like ChatGPT or Bard or something like that, and you ask it to say something, it, it'll do what they call hallucinating. You mean it, it's it's saying something, it's sentence structure is fine. It's got a noun, it's got a verb, it's got an adjective, you know, it makes sense, uh, but it isn't correct. And it's because it is able to, you know, th these la language models and AI use of them is is good at the syntax element. It, it knows how to form a sentence, uh, but it, it, that does not translate to me it, it knowing the meaning behind that sentence. And um, you know, you you mentioned that it's using like predictive text, so it's looking at the large databases that it has and using that to predict what what maybe a human would say in response to something like that. But there's no evidence that it knows what it is saying, um, you know, so that I think that's a, a huge piece of of how we are different uh, from these models. Well, yeah, and I guess from like, a, I hate to say a specious pr perspective, but like, does it even matter to be human? Because uh, mm -hmm. now where I work at Milligan uh, uh, University here, we have um, like four semesters of humanities and it's, I mean, exploring what does it mean to be human? But if you're I guess if you're just like, hey, if this someday becomes sentient, if you will, or whatever, that's where everyone goes with it already. It's like it's a you know sci-fi. It's sentient. It's not. Yeah. 
I guess, does it matter to be human? And, uh, you know, that's just, I, you know, that's a good thing to wrestle with. It's because if this thing can do things better than us, mm-hmm. and I, and I get like to a calculator, it can do math faster than me. That doesn't mean me doing math is not important, but I think people are starting to think that with this new technology, cause it's like, well, it can do math better than me. It can write better than me. Like poetry wise, why should I even learn it? Why not just outsource it? I, I know that's a loaded like question. Does it even matter to be human? But I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I do. And I I think that it does depend a little bit on your worldview. So I would say that, you know, as someone who affirms the soul and has mentioned the soul, I mean, part of the soul is that it is, we affirm that it is immaterial and it is eternal. So I think that the difference between that is that when all, you know, when matter is gone, when, you know, when computers and and wires and technology is completely, you know, disappeared, the sun has blinked out of the sky, your soul is still here if you affirm, if you're affirming that. And so I think it vastly matters that we are human. And so, and I think that, that, that uplifts what it, you know, the value of humans. That's why, you know, we, we have inalienable rights and and why it's important to, to care for the, uh, you know, the orphan, the widow, you know, you know, these things like, you know, why, why should we, you know, if utilitarianism would say that it's just better for society, if we didn't do that, you know, why should we do that? It's because we have enormous value. Um, so yeah, I, I mean that that dives into a, a whole other area, but I, I do think you know there is enormous value in being human because we you know of the eternalness of of who we are. Yeah, I love the I'm a, I love uh, existential uh, philosophy. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, I'm getting a little a little bit into Kierkegaard right now, but he writes uh, in poetry style, which isn't my thing. But uh, yeah, so I'm a fan. He is a uh, I I am a big fan of Kierkegaard, and I would definitely recommend his his work. I mean, if you really want to wrestle with with the tough things of life, as he did, and he certainly went through a fair share of suffering, you know, and and um, you know, I would rec- highly recommend him. Yeah. Well, in this whole period of time right now, it reminds me of the industrial revolution, but more for mm-hmm. the service uh, based industries, which it's going to affect production too. But um, I, you know, industrial revolution, we had a lot of pushback against that because it was like, you know, uh, people as craftsmen, you know, you become a master of something and that master apprentice. And there was this, uh, the learning a craft was so important. And then of course it became mass production versus, slow production but high quality it became you know cheap and fast and of course you get into marks and the alienating nation of the worker but now we're getting into that in the service industry where it's like do we really need somebody to at the hotel to check you in or do we really need a professor to teach you and so i think we're wrestling with that again and um i don't know i just did, did you have any thoughts on that i, I was just yeah, thinking of you know- that it's interesting you mention it because I, uh, you know, a, just a real life example, you know, I write a lot, as I mentioned, and I have a, an editor who I often work with and, you know, she's great and, and knows how I think and has read enough of my, you know, this, this unfortunate woman has read so much of my work and, you know, and she, uh, you know, but she does enjoy it. At least that's what she tells me. Um, and, uh, but anyway, I, I had recently written an article and thought, you know what, I, I really am okay with what I the semantics of what I'm saying, I'm looking more for syntax. So I said, let me just, let me plug it into chat GPT and say, you know, check for grammatical errors and issues. And um, it, I mean, it performed that wonderfully, you know, and I, I thought about that a lot because, you know, here's this editor who I've worked with for, you know, several years now. And, you know, but, but there is something different about what she can do for me as someone, as a human, a fellow human who is, knows my, you know, mind and my desires and goals and things like that. And I suppose you could argue that if I just spent time training chat GPT, maybe, maybe it could approximate that, but there's something generative about what she can do in terms of, you know, new ideas, you know, and that's, that's been a criticism of, of AI for a long time is that it, it, uh, what do they often say? Like it, it would never get to the, the, the theory of gravity because it, it can't, it can't come up with that. If it was using the model that we had, two millennia ago, it would suggest something totally different than if it was using the data, which we have now. So there's something about, you know, putting, when I'm putting text into something like chat GPT of, of having a fellow human who can not only think of what has been written, but also has the ability to generate new, new content that that's invaluable. So yes, I, I know there's, you know, like I said, the, the, the spark that caused me to write my, the article was, you know, a, a, 
sort of a pseudo fear of losing my job to chat GPT. But at the end of the day, you know, you know, I, I have, it's just been proven again and again to me that, um, you know, we can get very close and certainly some jobs will be impacted. Um, but humans will always have a role. Um, well, yeah, and I know human beings require a connection of some type. I, I think of music and uh, like if you imagine going and uh, watching a band, you know, Taylor Swift or Ed Sheeran or whoever's touring these days. I don't know. I'm getting old, so I don't really care. But um, and so imagine if they were just not up there and it was just like, you know, obviously you certain members of the band you can replace or like there's always additional stuff pumped in, you know, like there's. Um, you know, like, a, like percussion, you never see percussionists anymore. And people are okay with that. But you have to connect at a human level at some level. And we saw this with learning and teachers, like through a screen versus the human connection, there is something. And of course, that gets into what does it mean to be human? And does that matter? Because it's like, we, we need that connection, as we learned during COVID. Yeah. And so we lost a part of who we were during that. And so I, you know, the AI can't replace that. Um and so shifting gears a little bit on that, you know, I do think about the gestalts that you mentioned mm. and can it, again, I know, because then this gets into the, uh, what it means to be sentient, but it, I think it can, like, if you ask it to like, I asked it to make me some business cards and the first one was actually good. And then after that, they were, you know, not good, but I would say, I like this. I don't like that. And it would give me new ideas. I wouldn't have thought of. And I don't know if that happens enough time. Is it really creating anything new or is it just borrowing things and uh, splicing them together? Or is it technically creating new things? Because that's what we do as humans. I take right. a little Kierkegaard, mix it in a little bit of Jeremy yeah. Bentham. And, you know, I don't know. Yeah. What, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like this concept of, um, you know, generating from nothing or this ex nihilo, you know, it's like, to, you know, we, that's what we do. What what and when you see like the images that that some of these AI programs are are developing, you can almost see this the the elements that it's pieced together. It's searched what's available and it's it's put them together. And in some ways, it can uh, come up with something new. You know, so for example, you know, we we know that if you were to, you know the the classic thought experiment of to use the digits of pi, and if you were to assign a letter, you know, to each of them and you know, as they randomly, as they repeat that technically, because it is an infinite number that, you know, every event is documented within pi using that, that sort of an, a, so in the same way, we might say to simplify it a bit, you might say a broken clock is right twice a day. So it's just because something stumbles on something new does not mean that it generated it. It takes a human to acknowledge it and say, that's new, you know, and so it might produce something new, but it's not doing that, uh, you know, maybe to bring it into a historical context, it's not having a eureka moment. It's not, not it, it can produce it, but it's not jumping up and saying, this is new, you know. Um, is there anything else you want to uh, add in or, or do you yeah, want me to ask? I, well, no, I would, I would just, I think I would just say, you know, to, to kind of end with that, you know, I work in a field, obviously of medicine, and I've spent a lot of time in hospital rooms and I've, um, you know, surgery centers. And, you know, e even though I work in psychiatry, we have to, you know, we go through all the training. So I've been through all of it. Um, and, you know, when it comes to human suffering, which is what, you know, medicine is often, you know, we work with human suffering, that's, that's our realm. Um, you know, these, these models, you know, AI is getting very good. But when I think about even my own suffering and my own life, uh, if, if I'm in deep suffering or even like approaching the end of life, I want a fellow human beside me. And I, I don't, it doesn't matter to me how um, much that computer sounds like a human or even maybe looks like a human. Uh, I want to know that the person sitting next to me as I struggle or suffer or even, you know, die one day uh, is, is a fellow human and faces that same reality who knows that at the end of life, they too will die. So no know, knows in some ways what, what that's like. And so I think that when we talk about what is it, what's the value of being human, it in some ways is functional. It's saying, you know, when you're suffering, who do you want beside you? So I, I'm, you know, <laughs> I've heard stories of them saying, you know, when, when they, our AI overlords take over, they're going to scour all of these, you know, these recordings and things and find out who was, uh, for them and who was against them and kind of wipe out. So I, I feel like I've put myself clearly in that camp. So, you know, when they take over, I'm going to be, you know, <laughs> one of the first to go, I'm sure. 
but I do, I would do so saying it, it's of enormous value to be human. And I, I will, that's a hill I'll die on. <laughs>